Tonight, Canadian patients increasingly paying out of pocket for life-changing medical procedures. Trading cash for timely care. And I'm so glad that this kind of service exists. Because if I had to wait 18 months, like I can't imagine what it would be like. The privatization creeping into an overburdened system. Investigating foreign interference. Foreign interference in Canadian democratic institutions is unacceptable. After months of controversy, Ottawa taps a Quebec judge to lead a public inquiry into election meddling. Plus, capturing the red carpet for 30 years. How do you get an empty carpet with J-Lo? That's the hardest part of, of the story. Behind the lens with one of Canada's most prolific photographers. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. Public health care is part of a collective Canadian identity, but the strain on the system has triggered a new conversation about its future. The Canadian Medical Association is launching consultations about public and private care, saying the latest numbers show while governments still pay for 72 percent of all health care, patients now pay 11 percent out of pocket and private insurance covers 15. In our critical care series tonight, we look at the situation in Quebec, where there are fewer restrictions on for-profit medicine. Here's CTV's Vanessa Lee. Inside this Quebec operating room, surgeons perform 1,200 hip and knee replacements every year. It's uh, gonna let me uh, continue, with, uh, continue with my life, and I'm hoping that, you know, sometime in the fall, I get to knock a round of 18, right? That's what I'm looking forward to, really. <laughs> <laughs> See you after. Thank you. The major difference here, this is a private clinic, meaning patients are paying out of pocket. A hip or a knee replacement is around $24,000. It can vary according to the type of surgery. It feels like a mini hospital with everything done on site, from preoperative appointments to physiotherapy. It's led by four orthopedic surgeons who decided to leave the public system including Dr. Pascal André Vanditoli. Here at the clinic, I can do two times, three times, four times the, the volume as a surgeon uh, because I have no real limits. So as a surgeon, I'm much better used uh, in this clinic than in the uh, public hospital. A worrying trend for doctors fighting to improve universal public health care, a cornerstone of Canada's national identity. They siphon resources from the public system into the private system. So we lose doctors and nurses from the public system, which will actually exacerbate the wait times and exacerbate access to care. Across the country, wait times are still dragging on for Canadians hoping to have a joint replacement or cataract surgery. Last year, only 50% of patients were able to get a knee replacement within the recommended six months with 57% able to get a new hip in that time frame. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Monica Giordano was desperate for the pain in her right hip to go away. At one time I was thinking, you know, I might as well die because it was so painful. You can't sleep at night. You turn around, you can't. You walk, you can't. The 74-year-old retired dog breeder says the system failed her. After two long years, she got sick of waiting and decided to pay for a new hip. I said, no, I'm gonna take that money that we saved all these years. It's, you know, it's not worth living if you can't have the, the freedom to walk and to enjoy life. More and more people are also paying for primary care. So what we've been getting lately is people who've lost their family doctor. This clinic charges a yearly membership fee for access to family doctors. Staff say enrollment has tripled in the past year. If you do need to see a doctor, we're offering you an alternative. And as I mentioned, some people use it as an alternative until they get a doctor in the system. The reality is Canadians aren't getting the care they need when they need it. Many experts say the solution isn't private care. It's fixing the public system. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. A scathing new report by Ontario's ombudsman has confirmed what many families already knew that oversight mechanisms for the province's long-term care homes largely collapsed during the first wave of the pandemic.
The breakdown of the system, the lack of inspections was across the board. The investigation found there were no on-site inspections at facilities in the first seven weeks because there was no plan to keep workers safe. As a result, complaints about seniors not being fed, cleaned, or given medications went unchecked. In Calgary, the number of E. coli cases in nearly a dozen daycares has surged once again to 128, and 25 of those children are in hospital. It may be the largest outbreak of this specific type of shigatoxin E. coli in children under five years of age um, reported. Public health inspectors are still testing food samples from the centralized kitchen used by the daycares. A debate on how to investigate foreign election meddling is now over. After months of discussions, a public inquiry has been launched and a Quebec judge will be leading it. Here's CTV's Judy Trin. Justice Marie Jose Og is the federal government's choice to lead a public inquiry into foreign interference, an appointment signed off by all in Parliament. This negotiation, an extent to which we have involved opposition parties throughout the process, is unprecedented. Og will preside over an inquiry that former Special Rapporteur David Johnston recommended against. Johnston was forced to resign in June after his ties to the Trudeau family raised the possibility of bias. This is not an opportunity to score points. This is an opportunity to really restore confidence in our democracy. Og's mandate is to probe meddling in the federal elections of 2019 and 2021, not just from China, but Russia and other states too. Some say the selection of candidates should also be examined. We need to have our nomination processes as safe as our elections, and so that's why it's important. Og is fully bilingual, a judge with the Quebec Court of Appeal with 35 years of legal experience. But there's a hole in her resume when it comes to national security. You know, you've been inexperienced in to this issue, you tend to ask the wrong questions or you don't, uh, you know, dig deeply enough down the right sorts of channels. There is value also in finding a senior credible justice who comes to this issue uh, with, a, with a fresh set of eyes. Because of classified information, part of the inquiry will take place behind closed doors. We will continue to not just push for the government to be open and transparent and provide all the documents and waive all the cabinet confidences that may be required to ensure Canadians get their answer. Og is expected to make recommendations on safeguarding democratic institutions and protecting the diaspora. Omar, she has to file an interim report in six months and a final one by the end of 2024 before the next election. All right, Judy, thanks. The Prime Minister said today, for now, there is no room for a rapprochement with China as he focused on strengthening partnerships with the country's neighbours. Justin Trudeau is touring Asia, pitching Canadian businesses in one of the fastest-growing regions of the world. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver reports tonight from Singapore. Singapore is considered Asia's premier financial hub, but this bustling island nation has little farmable land and few natural resources, making it highly dependent on trade, especially from China. China is a big trading partner here in this part of the world. America is as well. Uh, there's a lot of geopolitical um, uh, issues around those, those partners. Um, and I think Canada is seen as, uh, as a market to diversify. It's that search for diversification the Prime Minister is trying to tap into as he tours the Indo-Pacific region. Canada is not just a source of solutions, but a source of opportunities for that. Here, he's pitching Canada to public and private sector investors as an innovative and reliable partner. What could be more important than stability and reliability in a time of such global uncertainty? Singapore imports about 90% of the food consumed here and prices like elsewhere in the world are soaring in part due to the war in Ukraine. Now some agricultural businesses appear increasingly interested in turning to Canada. Canada is a hot spot for us. We look forward to working together with the Canadian industry. Food security, trade and climate change are all expected to dominate the agenda at this week's G20 summit in India. But so is the war in Ukraine, a divisive topic among members that could overshadow the G20 summit. 
along with the fact that both the leaders of Russia and China are staying home. Until recently, Canada and India were involved in trade talks, but those are now paused with little explanation about why or what prompted it. Trudeau leaves for India tomorrow. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Singapore. Conservatives from across the country are in Quebec City tonight for a convention that saw a change in the party's brand on day one. This is the new logo of the Conservative Party of Canada unveiled today. And over the next few days, a number of other potentially controversial changes are up for debate. CTV's Kevin Gallagher is in Quebec City tonight. With his party leading in the polls, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev fired up supporters in Quebec City. Your home, my home. Our home. Let's bring it home. A message invigorating grassroots members. Absolutely energizing. Great to be here. All here to vote on what policies they think should be in the next election platform. We would like to improve the environmental policy of the party. We are pushing affordability of homes. While some proposals call for balanced budgets or tax incentives to build more homes, others are more socially contentious. And, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he navigates things that might not be as politically popular in the mainstream as it is for dyed-in-the-wool conservatives. At this convention, there are 55 different resolutions, including banning vaccine mandates and another prohibiting gender-affirming medical care for minors. We certainly ought to be very, very careful what we allow children to do with their bodies. It is not the job of any government uh, or of any political party to interfere in the m provision of evidence-based medical care uh, bet between a physician and a young person, their family. Uh, that is an overreach. There you go. These policy conventions do matter. Two years ago, conservative members voted against a resolution declaring climate change is real, undermining former leader Aaron O'Toole's environmental promises. Not all of the policy resolutions will make it to the final vote on Saturday, and even if they do, Polyev's made it clear he'll make the final decision on what goes in the platform. Omar? All right, Kevin, thanks. There was a new sighting today of the convicted killer who made a stunning escape from a Pennsylvania prison. The police manhunt is now in its eighth day. CTV's Joy Malbin with the new details of the brazen jailbreak. He scaled the prison wall like Spider-Man with another inmate standing nearby. Daniello Cavalcante crab walked up the wall to the roof, pushing through layers of razor wire in a brazen escape. This is an outrage. This should have never happened. You know that I was the prosecutor who was assigned to this case and I helped convict this man and he was sentenced to life with, you know, without parole. Um, we're all upset. The prison guard on watch never spotted him, giving the convicted murderer an hour's head start. That guard is now on leave. A stunning escape nearly identical to another inmate's attempt back in May, but that prisoner was seen and caught within minutes. After that, the Chester County prison installed razor wire, promising more security changes. But the new warden was on the job just one day when Cavalcante escaped. I cannot speak again to the technology at the prison. Uh, that is not my focus at this point in time. My focus is on capturing him. The manhunt has brought hundreds of officers using helicopters, horses, tracking dogs and drones. After a handful of sightings and seen on trail cameras, police are expanding their search area to a residential wooded area east of the prison. And still, the convicted murderer has evaded them. I believe he has always been very dangerous, and I've said that from the start. He's already murdered two people, one in Brazil and one here in a very brutal manner. Stabbing his girlfriend 38 times in front of her children two years ago, her sister is terrified. He's a master. When he's do with my sister, is terrible. No human, no. It's crazy. Police are offering a reward of $20,000 for any information, and the state attorney general is now investigating how the killer escaped in the first place. Omar? So many asking that very question. Joy, thanks. Coming up, sentencing day. I'm extremely proud of the named victims in this case for coming forward. A former sitcom star heads to prison for rape. Plus, capturing red carpet style with Canada's king of the celebrity photo.
TV star Danny Masterson found out today he'll spend at least the next 30 years in prison for raping two women 20 years ago at his home at the height of his fame. Those women were in court for the sentencing. CTV's Heather Wright on what they told him. A one-time star of the hit sitcom That 70s Show. In 10 minutes, there will be no more beer opportunities. Today, Danny Masterson was handed down the longest possible sentence for raping two women. Today in court, they described their trauma. You are pathetic, disturbed, and completely violent, one victim said. The world is better off with you in prison. The other woman told the court about her severe PTSD and waves of panic attacks, saying, I wish I'd reported him sooner to the police. I've gotten to know the uh, victims in this case. They are, were committed to making sure that justice gets served, and today they got it. The investigation into Masterson first began in 2017, just before the start of the Me Too movement, which began when a wave of women came forward detailing disturbing encounters with Harvey Weinstein. Initially, three women accused Masterson of giving them drinks and raping them when they passed out. Masterson's accusers were fellow members of the Church of Scientology, who they say tried to silence them when they came forward. They were instead put through ethics programs and warned not to report a member of such high standing. After the verdict, the church said in a statement, the testimony and descriptions of Scientology beliefs during the trial were uniformly false. Good morning, Danny. Hey, good morning. How are you? With his wife, actor Bijou Phillips, by his side, Masterson has been in court for nearly a year. A mistrial was declared last fall when the jury failed to reach a verdict in his first trial. In his second, he was found guilty on two of the three charges. His lawyers maintain Masterson is innocent and the sexual encounters were consensual. An appeal is pending as the former TV star begins serving his lengthy sentence. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. The race is on in southern Turkey to rescue a seriously ill American scientist who's been trapped 1,000 meters down a cave. International rescuers were able to get medical supplies to veteran cave diver Mark Dickey, who's experienced severe gastrointestinal bleeding. Um, as you can see, I'm up, I'm alert, I'm talking, uh, but I'm not healed on the inside yet, so I'm going to need a, a lot of help to get out of here. Experts say it could take days to get the 40-year-old out. Still ahead, lifting the veil on secret COVID vaccine contracts. A case of uh, extreme bullying uh, by these companies. Pharma accused of pandemic profiteering. New questions tonight about multi-million dollar COVID vaccine deals struck by Big Pharma. A previously secret contract is now public, and now health activists, including some Canadians, claim South Africa was bullied into unfair agreements. Here's CTV's Chris Najkate. As the world was dealing with an unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, the need for vaccines was urgent. In South Africa, health activists accuse big pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and the Serum Institute of India of bullying, profiteering, and unethical behavior. This was a vaccine apartheid, um, a case of uh, extreme bullying uh, by these companies and other organizations. In what's believed to be the first COVID-19 vaccine contracts made public, a report shows the contracts were under a veil of secrecy, included overwhelmingly one-sided clauses that protected the companies from legal liability and provided little leverage against delayed or cancelled supplies. The document also said South Africa reportedly paid Pfizer 32% more than the African Union. For the AstraZeneca vaccine, the Serum Institute of India likely charged more than double the price of what the European Union paid. And Johnson & Johnson reportedly charged 15% more than the EU. At the end of the day, they are for-profit uh, multinational companies that are accountable to those share shareholders not people's needs. In a statement, Johnson & Johnson said all global customers, including South Africa, paid $7.5 US dollars per dose for the COVID-19 vaccine, $2.5 cheaper than what was noted in the court documents. The Deputy Prime Minister was asked if Canada would make its vaccine contracts public, but would not comment. As I said, it was an emergency, 
um, we acted urgently and we got Canadians the vaccines they needed. Both Pfizer and the Serum Institute of India did not respond to CTV's request for comment. Omar. All right, Creason, thank you. The veteran journalist who made a career chronicling the story of this country and holding some of its most pivotal power players to account has died. Born in Vienna, Peter C. Newman came to Canada in 1940 as a Jewish refugee, shot at by the Nazis as he waited for a ship to freedom on the shores of Biarritz, France. That experience catapulted his desire to become a writer. He was awarded seven doctorates, numerous literary awards, and promoted to the Order of Canada's highest rank in 1990. Newman died in Belleville, Ontario, at the age of 94. After the break, celebrating the photographer to the stars. The Toronto International Film Festival kicked off today, and over the next 10 days, photographers will aim to get that perfect shot. One of them usually gets closer than most. CTV's Heather Butts on a new exhibit celebrating his celebrity snaps. Inside Toronto's Yorkdale Shopping Centre, a red carpet highlighting images of the world's biggest celebrities and the famed photographer who snapped them. The exhibit draws people into the work of George Pimentel. People loved to star seek and these photos are life size so it gives them a glimpse and it gives them an energy that they're actually near a star. 30 years of red carpet style, a career Pimentel says was built on honesty and integrity. I was never in the bushes, I would approach them. I really wanted everybody to trust me. I wanted to be that trusted photographer. His talent traces back to his grandfather, a photographer in a small village in the Azores. By 12, he was shadowing his father, whose photography studio served Toronto's Portuguese community. But it was a love for movies that would help secure his place on the red carpet. And this is where it all started, right here with Robert De Niro. His first photo of a Hollywood star 30 years ago. De Niro came out, the flash bulbs, the excitement and, and the energy. And I took this photo and I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. His portfolio is filled with Hollywood elite, skillfully capturing moments to remember. Then you have old Hollywood right here. This is my James Dean. For Pimentel, it's not always about the photo, but the stories behind them. No one will ever know the most stressful photo I've ever shot in my life right here. Right here. Because I'm directing. Before she gets there, I am clearing out the security. I'm clearing up publicists. I, like, I need J-Lo right here. And it's nice to just compose one frame, all this chaos, the security, everything around you, and it's such a challenge, and then just to get that shot, it's just a rush. An unwavering dedication and passion for his craft that he says is far from fading. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. A true talent. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather will be here tomorrow. For all of us at CTV National News, good night.